I'm Alan Drewin Boone. I'm the Conservation Program Manager at the Belize Zoo and Tropical Education Center. Sure, so we have, for the last 20 years, the zoo has provided an intervention, an alternative for people that come into conflict with jaguars, and it's called the Human Jaguar Conflict Program. So these are for jaguars that have been, for many reasons, have been basically thrust into the path of humans, but more specifically, they're domesticated and, and farm animals, livestock. So you're, t you're t talking dogs, pigs, sheep, cows, all of those, and probably even more. And um, what we've learned over the 20 years is that these are all jaguars that have, usually there's something wrong with them. They have some sort of impairment. They have broken teeth. They've been shot, ironically. So a perfectly healthy jaguar is seen near a community or a farm and is perceived to be a threat is shot with a shotgun and survives it, but ironically is now handicapped, crippled, if you want to call it that, and becomes dependent on easier prey. Animals that don't take as much speed or agility or strength to bring down. A, a dog, for example, is much easier to hunt than a tapir who will fight back. And so, in some ways, humans create these problems for themselves. Another issue that we have is one, we're losing a lot of habitat that keep these animals out of human-dominated areas, and we directly compete with with them for some of the game species that Belizeans enjoy. So your um, armadillo, your gibnot, some of the, the game birds that we hunt, which is fine when they're hunt, hunted within their open season and with a license, but when there's overexploitation, they're hunted for a sport, for trophy hunting, it's not sustainable, it's not legal. And that becomes an issue where there's not as much to go around, both for other people that really rely on it to feed their families, as well as these top predators. So you have these combination of factors that push them into these problematic situations. And typically how people would deal with it if they have no other alternative is to do so lethally. They'll shoot or poison the animals. So we've been able to partner with the forest department, with communities, to be in a position where when there's a jaguar report, once forestry has done their due diligence and checked out what the situation is, the zoo is able to go out, humanely trap and safely trap the jaguar and bring it to the zoo for long-term care. My favorite example of that is the most recent jaguar that came to the zoo. His name's Ben. And he is the first jaguar that has been documented in Belize for almost his entire life. So he lived in the Coxcomb Basin, which is, you know, in, is very internationally famous for being the first and only sanctuary ever set up specifically for jaguars. And it's the area of Belize that has the highest concentration, right? So Panthera, who are an, an NGO that study wildcats all over the world, they have had been on their cameras for 12 years in the coxcomb. So we always put out that, yeah, we know their average lifespan is 12 to 15 years in the wild, but here is a living example, 12 years of data showing Ben. So they actually mapped out his whole life history of being kind of king of the jungle, one of the top hunters in that area, held his own, held his territory. And as he started to decline, he would, would have been outcompeted by other healthier males, kind of marginalized to the edge of the territory, and sadly would end up going into rapidly developing farms nearby that were now encroaching in you know, what used to be jaguar habitat. So he ended up in this era, he was shot. So again, the, kind of like a textbook example, he was shot. So when he came to us, he had all these old uh, bullet wounds that he had sustained and had been systematically hunting cattle on a neighboring farm outside the, the protection of the Coxcomb Basin. So here we have again, the full life history of this jaguar where he's been seen to have contributed probably multiple times to the jaguar, the jaguar population in the wild, and then in a position where he is no longer able to fend for himself and would have probably been killed if there wasn't an alternative for him. And so he's now at the zoo in the second stage of, of his life, and it's coming up to the, I would say, to the, the twilight years. It's at an age where he'll, he's in retirement, we'll put it that way. And so he has contributed what he can to in situ or wild conservation, and now in this, chapter he would be contributing to education and awareness and exit or outside of wild areas as far as the conservation and awareness about his species. So the, the Tropical Education Center, part of our name is, is, an, is the other half of the organization and it's important because it complements what the zoo provides in a lot of ways. It's, um, it's able to, it gives us a platform where we can have more immersion with people that are visiting the zoo. So you do a day tour of the zoo or even a night tour, it's you know a few hours, it's, it can be meaningful, but 
for people that want more, they want more um, opportunities to learn about conservation or be engaged in different ways. The Tropical Education Center serves as a lodge, so we have accommodations, we have meals. It can serve as a teaching facility, both with an, a literal classroom and library, but also with a very extensive trail system where we can actually take people out into these wild areas. And because both facilities sit in the heart of the Maya Forest Corridor, there's a high likelihood that you will either encounter wildlife or see spaces where obviously wildlife have been, you know, maybe minutes or several hours before you walk the same path as they did. And so it really gives us an, an opportunity to showcase the, the, the spaces, the wild spaces that we're trying to save as much as the wildlife that inhabit it. And for that area, it's, it's, very, it's incredibly diverse. It's in the tropical savanna, which just like the TEC tends to be overlooked, people look at it as very hot, kind of open grassland that doesn't seem very rich and diverse. But if you take a moment, you slow down and walk these areas, you'll find more than a quarter of Belize's entire biodiversity in these areas, uh, including many endemic species. In other words, species you will find nowhere else in the world occupy this little tiny footprint of grassland and pine savanna that provide a corridor for wildlife and uh, again all these teaching opportunities for people that really want to understand deeper aspects of um, biodiversity and conservation in Belize. So the Belize Zoo is home to currently about 45 different species of native wildlife and they're represented by over 180 individuals. So that's everyone from the, the five wild cats. So all species that occupy Belize are represented at the zoo. Both species of primates that we have, um, the national animal, the tapir, and a host of different mammals and birds. And those are just the animals that we actively care for. Again, the beauty of visiting a place like the zoo, which is within a wildlife corridor, is when you visit, you'll also see a, a variety of species that are there naturally, that just occupy that space and kind of do their own thing. They do benefit from the feeding and the care that goes into the animals that have been rescued, but they're free, they're free, free moving, they're free flighted, they run around or fly around the, the spaces and they just enrich the experience that people can have when they come to the zoo. So in other words, even for guides that come almost every week, it's always a different experience because they never know how the animals that are cared for by the, by the zoo will react or be, and also the ones that are just there kind of moving around. So with those, you'll have iguanas, you'll have a variety of species of snakes, you'll have migratory species. So it's always cool for us to be able to host guests from North America, for example, and they're stunned to see some birds that they just left in their own backyard sitting right here in Belize on their migratory paths during the winter or the fall. And so, the zoo and by extension the corridor also is not just home to our native wildlife but it's a critical part of the life history of these animals that leave the, 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 their um, resident grounds during the winter because there's no food, there's no resources to keep them sustained. So if we are unable to provide that in the tropics when they're looking for food and safe haven then it has a lot of, it has far-reaching implications for these species that are part of the North American landscape or even the South American landscape. So we have multiple avenues and all of them are listed on our website and our social media. So one of the two of the typical ways that people do it where they feel like they'll get something in return is to either become a member of the zoo for a year or to adopt an animal or sponsor one for a year. So either of these options are available and with membership it comes with varying tiers of perks. So they get free admission to the zoo for a year for example. They get um, added to our mailing list so they get regular updates. Some of them come with um, a certificate with some of the, the books that we have written over the years are mailed to them so they get a physical package. For people that adopt animals they get a photo of the animal they adopted, a little natural history sheet, an official certificate and again specific updates to that species, any events, any um, research that's going on on that species or anything specific to the animal at the zoo so sparks the tapir or Linda the Jaguar if they get new enrichment, a habitat upgrade, that sort of thing. So it, it's a way of keeping communication open and keep, making them feel like they're included in the progression of the zoo. It's, so it's belizu.org is the website and we're on Facebook and social, um, sorry, Facebook and Instagram. 
just under the Belize Zoo. I would say go for it. I would say even if it's not necessarily your field, the reality with wildlife conservation today is that it takes a lot more than just people like myself. It takes more than biologists and zoologists and people that love animals. Um, we can't do it on our own and it will never get accomplished if it's only us doing it. So I say to people that may have expertise or passion in other areas, marketing, uh, uh, education, or even they're more tech, tech savvy, they're more into business management. These are the stakeholders that we try to engage because they are the ones that have different resources and different skill sets to help us move the conversation further. Um, oftentimes our, our programs are successful because we get the buy-in of businesses or people that know the right, you know, they network well, they know how to, how to get people engaged. We may be speaking to the wrong people and we don't even know it and others that are supportive of what we do um, are able to get us in front of the right audiences. So I will say that you don't have to completely reimagine your careers if you're in a separate career and you think, oh, well, I have to, you know, maybe, there may be some hesitancy because they feel they have to go back to school and study wildlife biology or so on. I would say it's more important to start partnering or reaching out to the NGOs like the zoo. There's, there's many of us. There's, I'm obviously here repping the zoo and I'm coming to bat for the zoo, but there are many wonderful conservation NGOs in Belize that need help as well reach out, start, all of us are on social media. You have to be, otherwise you get left behind. Start doing your homework, checking out the NGOs that really resonate with you, the work they do. Um, most importantly, I'll also note that the critical part of wildlife conservation isn't just about focusing on the animals, so you can look for those that are trying to engage people, which ultimately people are the, the make or break for whether wildlife survive. So do your homework, start putting out feelers for, for NGOs that resonate with the kind of work you'd like to be doing and see and ha start having conversations with them. We're all very approachable. Most of us, you know where to find. And you know you, we can have a dialogue about where our gaps are as far as volunteering, as far as gaps in you know, messaging, social media, or financing. You know, a lot of us don't have time to, to check the numbers because we're out you know, in the field and so on. So I, I encourage young people that, again, want to support wildlife conservation but have a passion in a, another field, there are very creative ways, we've had to do it ourselves, there are very creative ways to combine those passions and still support something that you have a love for but you may not necessarily want to be at the helm of, of conserving. Same thing, then reach out to the wildlife conservation NGOs. We have a variety of opportunities, so I'll speak for the zoo specifically. Um, for high school students, we have our conservation camp that I'm a product of, so I, I, will, I will cheerlead for that as much as I can. Um, myself and many others are examples of students that were at high school age that decided they wanted to get a feel for this work, to get a little bit of immersion. It's a week-long program we do in the summer, so it's manageable. It's something that you, know, you can do just to get an idea of what it takes to get into wildlife conservation and get some ideas going and then charter a path through you know studying biology or something something fundamental in Belize and then there are many opportunities often provided by these NGOs that can take your your career your academic career further through scholarships through uh, grants and so on to study abroad and then most importantly bring that knowledge and skill set back to Belize because we need them back home.